We could just ignore it and pretend that this isn't an issue, right? And just let our bodies be exposed all the time to something that's a big question mark. Or we can understand how EMFs actually affect our cells, affect our tissues, affect our neurons. And then maybe we can at least just take some appropriate action to protect ourselves. No one's asking you to wear a tinfoil hat and run around the block like a weirdo. We're talking about, hey, what are some realistic things based upon the fact that these EMFs aren't probably going anywhere and we need to protect ourselves the best that we can. So most of us know that EMFs come in different frequencies, right? Like we've heard of X-rays and gamma rays, which we protect ourselves from because these are high frequency EMFs, right? So like they can actually damage our DNA. They literally can like rip an electron out of an atom, right? So that's why you wear protective gear when you get an X-ray and yada yada and why you want to limit exposure. So why wouldn't chronic exposure to lower frequency EMFs be a problem? Well, the bottom line is that the evidence is suggesting that they could be problematic. It's just one of these things that it's so conflicting, it's hard to come up with anything concrete. But the evidence is becoming stronger that, yeah, it's probably not the best thing, so let's maybe take some positive action to protect ourselves. After today's video, I put a link down below for a place that you can get good quality food. I guess that's one good way you can protect yourself, and that's Thrive Market. That is a 30% off discount link for all your groceries through Thrive Market. So using that link down below, you get 30% off your entire first grocery order. If you haven't checked out Thrive Market in a while, they've seriously changed their game and they've stepped it up even more. So they really are prioritizing ingredient quality. That's like their main focus. How do we make super good quality ingredient food accessible to people as many places as possible? So it's like shopping there is more like shopping in Europe, like good quality food without hidden ingredients and hidden artificial things. It's really cool. And that link down below again is for 30% off plus a free gift when you use that special link down below. So again, try them out, get that 30% off your full grocery order and enjoy some good quality food delivered to your doorstep. Getting down to brass tacks, the data is somewhat scarce, but now it's starting to pile up. Like we're having newer study after newer study after newer study because people are starting to ask the questions. And on average, it takes 15 to 17 years for studies to really come to fruition and really give us anything concrete. So maybe we're headed that way. And is it something we really want to gamble with all the time? There was a 2023 study published in the Frontiers of Neuroscience. I'll just read you a quote from it. It says, ELF EMF, which is extremely low frequency EMF, on different frequencies and intensities will have various effects on biological activities. But the research on the health effects of ELF and EMF cannot come to a consistent conclusion. That is pretty solid saying, hey, there is an effect. We see something happening, but we can't draw a conclusion on whether it's super dangerous or super safe. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty vague statement that I don't necessarily want to gamble on. And I'm not saying that I'm going to move to the forest and avoid as much EMF as possible, but I am saying I'm going to pay attention to what it's doing to my body. So let's dive in more. If we go back to 2013, there was a guy named Dr. Martin Paul, P-A-L-L, and he was doing a lot of work surrounding this hypothesis of EMFs affecting what are called voltage-gated calcium channels. Essentially, it's like an electrical gate for our cells, which I'll explain a little bit more. He looked at 23 different studies and ultimately found that EMFs affect these voltage-gated calcium channels. They essentially activate these electrical calcium channels essentially stimulating our cells to kind of be on, which is sort of what we feel. Like, have you ever gone to like New York City or LA or like a really busy city and you're like, I feel like my skin is buzzing? That might not be in your head. That might be like a very real thing where you're getting like additional stimulation at a cellular level, at an electrical level. So essentially what's happening is you're getting a flood of calcium that's coming into the cell. And this is activating essentially like a two calcium chlamydulin dependent nitric oxide synthase pathway. And what that means in human terms is you're getting a bunch of just electrical stimulation at a cellular level, and it's creating a bunch of additional nitric oxide. Am I losing you yet? What is this nitric oxide gonna do? Well, nitric oxide kinda has two fates. It sort of has like, it hits a fork in the road. Nitric oxide can be very beneficial but it can also go another direction and form something not so good. Nitric oxide is also a precursor to something that is known as peroxynitrate. This is going to trigger a lot more oxidative stress and essentially free radicals within the body. So 
Dr. Martin Paul's work was essentially saying that at like sort of this electrical metabolic level, we're creating these toxic byproducts that are creating more oxidative stress. So he wasn't coming at it saying like, okay, EMFs are like microscopic razors attacking our cells. He was like, no, it's triggering this electrical impulse that's causing an additional release of nitric oxide that's causing a subsequent release in oxidative stress or reactive oxygen species. So basically extra electrons kind of flowing around, bouncing everywhere and triggering this oxidative stress. Now, most of us know in the metabolic space that oxidative stress is problematic. Like you exercise too hard, you cause damage. You stress yourself out too much, you cause damage. You don't get enough sleep, you cause damage at an oxidative level, right? So essentially, by being out in high EMF environments or chronically exposed to EMF, we might just be triggering this extra oxidative stress that's slowly chipping away at us. But in 2025, they did some research to expand upon Dr. Martin Paul's work. And essentially what they found is that although they couldn't prove everything, what they proved is that when it comes to EMFs, it is the reactive oxygen species that seems to be the problem. So whether that reactive oxygen species is coming from ionizing radiation or this voltage-gated calcium channel that Dr. Martin Paul talked about, that part is a little bit undecided. But what we do know is that it's the oxidative stress seemingly causing the issue. So then we pivot over to a study that was published in Scientific Reports. And this was looking at more like the neurological and even the mitochondrial level, which is gonna be fun because if you watch this channel, you know that I'm into the mitochondria and I'm into the metabolic side of things. But let's look at the neural route first. In this first study in Scientific Reports, they had subjects hooked up to an EEG so they could really measure their brain waves. And they divide them into two groups. One group uh, held a cell phone, so they were chronically exposed to EMF. Okay, for 18 minutes, and then they had them sit for 18 minutes without the phone. Okay, and then another group did it flip flop. Okay, they did vice versa. Pretty darn significant findings here. They found that when they were exposed to higher levels of EMF, their alpha waves were strongly distorted and disrupted. They were unable to get into that calm state. So alpha waves are where we'd be like calm but awake, right? So it's like you're you're not being stimulated by something. So your alpha waves are higher because you're awake and you're alert, but you're not being stimulated by something where maybe gamma waves might come in or something else. But what they're finding is that the alpha waves were disrupted and actually dipping and they weren't staying consistent. So it was actually affecting our brain waves just by being temporarily exposed to EMF, changing how our brain is functioning and ultimately feeling. Well, they did a subsequent study and they wanted to see, okay, well, what happens if we look at like rats with this where we can expose them more? So they did different bouts of EMF for different periods of time and different intensities. What they strangely discovered here is that it seemed to disrupt the blood-brain barrier. So it actually made it so the blood-brain barrier was more permeable, affecting the tight junctions within the brain. So being exposed to EMF may actually make it so that not so good things can get into the brain easier. So there might be a secondary effect, which probably isn't the cause of the brain waves changing per se. That could actually literally just be penetrating the brain. But when it disrupts the blood brain barrier, then all kinds of other things can get through and cause more metabolic, deeper damage to the brain. But now let's talk about the mitochondria. Okay, most of us know the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, yada, yada. But it's where energy is manufactured. And it's really just like a quantum quantum engine in so many ways. Like you've got so many different things happening there from different, you know, proton gradients and ultimately creating ATP from what's called the proton motive force, which is essentially moving down like this electron gradient to produce energy. I mean, it's complex when you get down to the very specifics of it, but it really is just an energy gradient. So it's basically like electrons moving through and ultimately creating energy by moving through this system. That's the complex yet simple way of explaining it. Well, it turns out that EMF can affect this proton motive force, making it so that electrons don't move as efficiently through that process. So they end up actually getting kicked out of the process. So you have these rogue electrons that move out and don't go through the process of creating energy. So you've lost energy efficiency so you're not producing energy as well, but then you also have additional electrons that are now floating around and reacting with things and oxidizing things. There you have reactive oxygen species, just rogue electrons, right? So not only do you have an increase in reactive oxygen species, you also have a decrease in the ability to clear out 
that reactive oxygen species. What happens here is it leads to damage of the mitochondrial DNA. So then the DNA itself within the mitochondria is so disrupted that you start to develop more dysfunctional mitochondria. You get where I'm going with this. So just because the energy manufacturing is disrupted, that's not the only problem. The problem is now the mitochondria DNA is so disrupted that it's causing the new mitochondria to be disrupted too, even if not exposed to EMF. So you see, maybe this whole metabolic dysfunction thing that we're dealing with is deeper than just food, deeper than just the things we consume or a lack of exercise. Those things are very important and certainly matter, but perhaps just our exposure chronically to EMF is making it easier for a mitochondria to be dysfunctional. But when you talk about metabolic dysfunction in general, there's a study that was published in the Brain Research Bulletin. I'll just read an excerpt from that and then it'll kind of send us down a different channel for a minute. EMF can activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is responsible for the stress response. So essentially you're having a cortisol release. You're having an increase in cortisol simply by being exposed to EMF. And we've seen this in the literature, right? Now this is causing a stress response. That stress response can impede insulin signaling. It can have all kinds of metabolic effects, right? You're essentially stuck in fight or flight all the time and not even realizing it. But if we couple that with some evidence that was published in Electromagnetic Biology and Medicine, it was looking at the effects on heart rate variability, which has a close tie with the metabolic system. We're not talking about regular heart rate, we're talking about heart rate variability. So what happened in this study? Bottom line is they had people go on a phone call wearing either EMF protection devices or not. They put EMF protection on their phone, a pendant and an insole. Okay, so they protected them from EMF the best they could. And then they had another group that did not. Simply put, the group that was protected actually had an improvement in their heart rate variability, showing that their stress resilience was better. Those that were just, just openly exposed to the EMF actually had a decrease in their heart rate variability. So even in a short-term acute measurement, it decreased their resilience. It decreased their ability to toggle back and forth between sympathetic and parasympathetic. It affected their nervous system. But here's what's crazy. They tested their salivary cortisol levels. Those that were protected from EMF had lower cortisol. Those that were just openly exposed to the EMF had an increase in their salivary cortisol levels, like an acute increase in their cortisol. But lastly, with all the scary stuff, we have to dovetail this all together with a study that was published in 2025 that actually looked at how EMFs could be affecting literally insulin resistance. It says, correlation was observed between chronic EMF exposure and increased insulin resistance, oxidative stress, and disruptions in hormonal balance, which can exacerbate hyperglycemia. Essentially what this study did is it attributed EMF's effects on oxidative stress, cortisol, and to a certain degree, even those voltage-gated calcium channels we talked about earlier, saying these are all impacting metabolic health. So what does all of this mean? Like how can we protect ourselves based upon knowing this? but we need to do the simple things first, okay? Obviously, antioxidant production, the best that you can. Vitamin C, vitamin E, moringa, urolithin A, um, sulforaphane, things like this that are gonna support these antioxidant processes within the body, okay? But it's also really important, this is why things like fasting, things like periodic breaks from food, things like intense exercise, like these things really matter because they upregulate our body's ability to have our own antioxidant systems in place, right? Now, those are all very generic, basic things, like how do you actually protect yourself from this? But we have to look at the facts that, hey, essentially the problems are a couple fold. It's oxidative stress, okay? We may not be able to combat it, but we can at least do what we can to support our body's functions of clearing oxidative stress. And it's going to be protecting ourselves from this overstimulation, these voltage-gated channels, right? So with that, things like magnesium, because it opposes calcium. So taking in magnesium can help reduce that overstimulation from these voltage-gated calcium channels that are getting overly stimulated. So attenuating that response and actually turning down some of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, like cortisol stress response, that comes from the constant stimulation there. It's pretty fascinating what magnesium can do for us there. It binds to this NMDA receptor that actually 
blocks that calcium for a little bit. So it can block that effect. So that's probably one of the biggest ones. And then obviously the good things, right? High dose vitamin C, not from absorbic acid, from things like acerola cherry or from whole foods whenever possible, right? Or whole food form vitamin C. Broccoli, but just remember that like broccoli, you could use something like mustard on broccoli and it can actually activate what's called sulforaphane better. Garlic, but you wanna cut it up and let it sit for like 10 minutes. It activates what's called the allicin, which has more of the compounds in it to help improve what's called the NRF2 pathway. Moringa is a really good one too. Very potent when it comes to NRF2 activation, which is our body's natural detoxification processes, upregulating glutathione, upregulating superoxide dismutase, okay? And then of course, saunas, right? Clearing some of the toxins, increasing this rate of sort of, I guess you could call it elimination to a certain degree, right? Oxidative stress also, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you're getting enough sleep, right? So how do you capitalize on that or how do you optimize that? All those categories that you can do to kind of reduce the overall stress load on your body. Then of course, there's the actual physical protection piece. Like obviously, do what you can to not hang out in places that are like directly underneath extremely low frequency EMF power lines. Like the, the thing, this stuff matters. And there's places in the world that actually regulate how much EMF there is, like even over school areas. Like Switzerland can only have certain levels of EMF when they're over public schools, right? These kind of things are there for a reason. And I'm not suggesting that we freak ourselves out and again, put on a tinfoil hat and run around the neighborhood. It's a matter of, hey, how can I protect myself within a relative means without being a complete weirdo? Or if you wanna be a weirdo, be a weirdo if it's how you protect yourself. But I think the best thing we can do is by doing it through food, doing it through exercise and occasional supplementation. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.